Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, you know from time to time I dive back into the American Civil War. It's an area of history that I, I have studied all my life that I feel like I know pretty well. And uh, we're going to go back to our friend Montemayor to what I think is one of his earliest videos. And this is on Stonewall Jackson's Valley Campaign of 1862. You know, there are a few figures in American history who have the mythology built around them uh, and almost this godlike status like Thomas Jonathan Jackson. Uh, he's gone down in hi history as, in a lot of people's minds, one of the great generals of all time who whose death uh, at Chancellorsville completely changed the trajectory of the war and cost the South any chance for victory. And with most, as with most things in history, the truth is much more complicated than that. And I would argue that were it not for Jackson's Valley campaign, he would have gone down in history as a pretty good Corps commander and nothing more. Um, because honestly, if you look at the rest of his resume, if you take out the Valley campaign and the Battle of Chancellorsville, Stonewall Jackson's record is not all that impressive. But the Jackson, the Valley Campaign of 1862 is what made his name. It's what cemented his status in mythology. That and his death uh, at the hands of his own men uh, after his you know, masterful flank attack uh, at the beginning of the Battle of Chancellorsville. So we're going to look at the Valley Campaign today, talk a little bit about it. And uh, as always, if you want to see the original video without my commentary, the link will be in the description below. I'll also put some links to some other uh, content related to the American Civil War uh, up at the end so you can check out some more of my videos that way. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. The American Civil War is a year old and the Union decides to put an end to the Confederacy once and for all. So before we even get into this, real quick, for any of our um, uh, followers who might not be real familiar with the American Civil War and you're wondering why those states in the middle are a different color, and uh, they're light blue instead of blue, uh, these are states that remained in the Union, either by choice or, in Maryland's case, kind of by force, um, kept in the Union, um, and didn't join the Confederacy, but were also slave ho slaveholding states where slavery was still legal. So Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia doesn't actually exist at this point. They didn't become a state until 1863. Uh, they were a breakaway from Virginia. This is all a part of Virginia before the American Civil War. Uh, they formed their own state in 1863, Maryland, and then Delaware. North builds a huge army and plans to invade the South and capture Richmond. Major General McClellan, with over 100,000 troops, would conduct an amphibious landing, while Major General McDowell, with 40,000 troops, would advance from the north in order to conduct a pincer movement on Richmond. Now, the question might be, why on earth would you do an amphibious landing when you could send your main army over land and maybe send the distraction force this way? There's a lot of reasons why McClellan chose to do this this way, but uh, one of the reasons why the Union armies constantly go... Uh, Richmond has, is one of the targets from the beginning of the war because it's the Confederate capital. It's really close to the Union capital. It's accessible. You don't have to have really long supply lines to get to Richmond, unlike in the West, where you've got much farther to go to get to places like Atlanta, Nashville, and those places. Uh, so uh, it's all about supply, and it's all about water. Uh, by going down this line, crossing at Fredericksburg, and getting right at Richmond, it's not only the most direct route, it's also close to water, which protects your left flank as you're going south, but also allows for easy supply, because you can send supply ships right down the Potomac River and then just offload those supplies wherever you need them without having to transport them over land a really long distance. So you don't have to protect supply lines because you've got complete control of the river for the most part. Uh, but of course, we're talking about the Shenandoah Valley today. And in charge of the Shenandoah Valley was Major General Banks. The Shenandoah Valley was important because it was a natural invasion route towards the North's key cities. A Confederate army. It's it's more important than just that. There, uh, like everything, it's it's complicated. Yes, the Shenandoah Valley. There was a concern for the Union 
that the Confederates could send an army up the Shenandoah Valley and using the Blue Ridge Mountains, using the mountains, they can screen their movements. And we see that happen, uh, for example, in the Antietam campaign where uh, the Confederates actually do use the mountains to screen their movements and make it harder for the Union to know exactly where they are. So that is a concern, but it, it's a concern that works both ways. It's also a concern for the uh, Confederacy because, number one, uh, it was known as the granary of the Confederacy or the breadbasket of the Confederacy because there's a lot of, uh, it's a very fertile valley and there's a lot of crops grown there, a lot of farms that can be used to feed the armies. Uh, though by the end of 1862, a lot of that has been destroyed. Uh, and so that's a secondary concern by the later stages of the war. But at this point in the war, it is still the breadbasket or the granary of the Confederacy. Uh, so th there's a lot of fertile uh, farmland there. Uh, the entrance to the Shenandoah Valley is the town of Winchester. And Winchester is going to end up being the most fought over city in the entire con uh, the entire war. Changes hands something like 60 or 70 times uh, because this was an area that was constantly being fought over. Army could move through the valley and attack Washington, D.C. from its rear. This worried President Lincoln. He wanted his capital to be completely safe from any threat during McClellan's grand campaign. So Banks' mission was to clear the valley, and once he was done, he would send men over the Blue Ridge Mountains to help and aid the main effort at Richmond. And, and that's another factor in this, is that you get through the Shenandoah Valley, and now you can advance uh, from this way, and you could actually have a third prong to your attack on Richmond. Probably not from up here near Winchester, probably closer down here around Lynchburg in that area, um, where you can come at Richmond from the west. And so now you've got an army coming down with McDowell from Washington. You've got McClellan's main force coming up the peninsula, and you could have a third uh, force coming in from the west. It looked grim for the Confederates. General Johnson had only 60,000 men at the Capitol. Clearly, McClellan had superiority, but one of the biggest faults other than being overly cautious and passive was that he constantly kept overestimating the enemy's strength. And it's important to remember that at this point in the war, Robert E. Lee is not a field commander for the Confederate Army. He's an advisor to uh, Jefferson Davis in Richmond. I think Lee's official title was that he was the head of all the Virginia troops, but he didn't have a field command. Uh, Joe Johnston is the field commander. And Johnston, I mean, that's an understandable thing. Joe Johnston was one of only a handful of men who had a general's commission in the regular Union Army before the war. Uh, and he's the only one who plays a significant role in the American Civil War who was a general before the war started, at least in field command. Um, so uh, Johnston is going to end up being wounded at the Battle of Seven Pines during uh, the battles around Richmond during this, and it's then that Robert E. Lee is going to take command. He thought Johnston had as many soldiers as his army. For this reason, he felt it was crucial to have McDowell's corps coordinate with his army if there was to be any chance of success. And a lot of people try to excuse McClellan on the whole thing. Like He would always think that however many men he had, the Confederates had a little bit more. Uh, and a lot of people say, well, he was given bad intelligence. He was using the Pinkertons and folks like that to give him intelligence. While that is true, uh, there were a lot of generals in his command who knew those numbers were bogus. Uh, men like Phil Kearney, for example, who just were livid that McClellan would not attack Richmond when he had the chance because they knew that Richmond was much weaker defended than McClellan was acknowledging. Uh, so it wasn't a cut and dry thing where everybody on the Union side thought the Confederates had all those men. And in the valley was Major General Stonewall Jackson. His small army of 5,000 men were tasked with not only defending the valley, but to prevent Union troops there from being sent to the east. He had to keep Banks' army in the valley. Jackson realized that he could create a strategic diversion if he could destroy Banks' command and give the impression of a drive on Washington itself. This would cause federal troops to be dragged into the valley instead of advancing onto Richmond. Now think about the guts it takes to have an attitude like that. All right, I'm outnumbered six to one by Banks's army, uh, his force in the valley. Not only am I going to keep him busy, but I'm going to do so well that I'm going to keep this other 40,000 man force busy as well. The problem was that Jackson did not have the numbers. Not at yet. all. In February 1862, Banks advances with 30,000 men. 
Does Jackson make a heroic stand? No, he is completely outnumbered and pulls back. He and this is a common strategy that is used in wars throughout history. George Washington used it all the time. Uh, you know, it's uh, it was used by uh, Sam Houston to eventually win Texas independence. That idea of pull back, pull back, pull back until you see an opportunity. Nathaniel Green used this against Cornwallis in the South during the American Revolutionary War. It's it's a brilliant strategy when you're heavily outnumbered to force your enemy who has a bigger army and moves slower and has to deal with supply lines and deal with trying to hunt you down to spread out to move cautiously, and then you wait for an opportunity to strike. He leaves Winchester, promising to be back again. Banks' mission was considered complete, and they began to divide his force and send troops over the Blue Ridge Mountains to support the main campaign. Jackson finally saw his chance. His scouts reported that no more than four regiments were there, so Jackson went for it. Unfortunately for Jackson, the reports were wrong. The Union force actually had twice his numbers, so although Jackson had every intention of giving himself the better odds, he ended up bringing only 3,800 Confederates against a Union force of 8,500 men. The Battle of Kernstown was a Confederate defeat. Actually, it would be Jackson's only defeat in the Civil War. Jackson... It's hard to say it was Jackson's only defeat because Jackson didn't typically command an army in the field. This is really kind of the only time he's gotten independent command. So there weren't many opportunities for a defeat. Uh, you could argue that at some of the other battles he fought that were he the only command there, he might have been defeated. So I don't know how I feel about that. Kernstown in my family is important because my great-great-great-grandmother uh, had a brother who was killed at the Battle of Kernstown. Uh, he was, uh, his name was Fred Stillwagon. He was 18 years old. He was in the uh, 1st West Virginia Infantry, uh, along with three of his brothers. All four brothers served in that unit together. And uh, he was killed there. He's in an unknown grave, probably in the Winchester National Cemetery. Um, and he, his unit was actually fighting against the Stonewall Brigade during the Battle of Kernstown. But it was, was a victory. However, this battle will prove extremely important because although it was a tactical defeat, it was a strategic victory. This so what does that mean? Okay, so I know some of us understand what that means, but not everybody does. So what's a tactical defeat, but a strategic victory? So typically in military terms, when we're talking about tactics, we're talking about an individual battle. So a tactical defeat means you lost the battle. But a strategic victory means that the overall strategic aims, the campaign, the, the bigger picture, it means you can lose a battle, but strategically win. So um, the Battle of Antietam tactically was a draw. Neither side, the Union or the Confederates, really won the Battle of Antietam. But for the Union, it was a strategic victory. Why? Because Robert E. Lee's invasion of the North is stopped and he withdraws into Virginia. That means even though Lee didn't lose the battle, he lost the campaign. And so that's the difference. So in this case, that means that even though Jackson loses the battle strategically, it puts him in a position to win the campaign audacious, bold attack by a smaller army caused great alarm in Washington. Lincoln believed they were dealing with a real threat of a potential dash to the capital. Troops were diverted back into the valley to defeat Stonewall's army. Banks' army, now numbering 19,000 men, began its advance up the valley on April 17th. And once again, Jackson pulled back to safety. And of further consequence, McDowell's Corps, the one that McClellan needed so badly for his pincer movement, was taken out of McClellan's direct command. It was ordered to stay put until Jackson's threat was cleared. And that's why it's a strategic victory, because Jackson has now not only um, pulled Banks back into the valley deeper, but he's prevented McDowell's Corps from advancing to the south. And that's really the, impo the, the major importance of this. Now, with that said, knowing how McClellan was not really interested in moving all that much, um, I don't know if McDowell's Corps advancing on Richmond would have made much of a difference, but we'll never know for sure. Mission accomplished. Jackson has diverted the Federals from Richmond for now. There were over 20,000 Union troops scattered throughout the Allegheny Mountains under Major General Fremont. The presence of this force was a thorn on Jackson's side. Major General Johnson, with 3,000 men, guarded the approaches from the mountains. Major General Ewell and his division is nearby with 8,000 men, and Jackson's army has swelled up to 8,000 as well. 
Stonewall commences his brilliant campaign by defeating this isolated army first. Jackson's army was extremely mobile compared to the Federals. There is a reason why they are called Jackson's Foot Cavalry. He heads south to combine with Johnson's command and at the Battle of McDowell has a victory against a Union force under Brigadier General Milroy. So it's important to note here now that the original strategic picture where you have Jackson with just 5,000 man, men and Banks with 30,000 has changed dramatically at this point. We're not dealing with six to one odds against Jackson. Now Jackson at McDowell's got a two to one advantage in numbers. And overall, between both armies, or between both forces, Jackson's and then the, the force under Yule, uh, when you add that to Milroy and Banks, there's really not a tremendous difference in numbers. Around this moment, Banks was again having to withdraw his troops away from the valley, and he had to pull back to Strasbourg. Oh. And something else I want to stop and point out here is that when you see these numbers, when you see the, the number of, of men in an army, and this is something Grant talks a lot about in his memoirs, you have to remember that just because a man has 19,000 men in his army does not mean that there are 19,000 men available to fight because an army requires a lot of jobs, let's say, to be done other than fighting on the front lines and especially for the union armies people this is something people always forget when they talk about all oh, the big manpower advantage the union had yes that's true but the union also had a additional challenge the south didn't have which is having to expend sometimes as much as a third of their manpower uh, in protecting supply lines, especially as they go deeper and deeper into the South. They've got to guard these long supply lines. And so that's a challenge the Union has the Confederacy doesn't have, at least not as much. Over half his force goes over the Blue Ridge Mountains to support the drive onto the capital. And once more, Jackson sees his opportunity. He coordinates with Ewell's division and heads north. Now, does he attack Strasbourg, which has fortifications? Heck no. He crosses the Massanutten Mountains and combines with Yule and heads towards Front Royal, which only has a garrison of 900 men. It's Front Royal. Uh, Royal would be if it had knee on the end of it. It's 900 versus 17,000. Front Royal falls on the 23rd of May. Now Banks sees that he could be cut off, so his army flees north. It is a close run with Jackson in hot pursuit. Banks makes a stand with what is left of his command. 3,500 men versus Jackson's 16,000. Banks was completely routed and Banks' command was officially destroyed. So again, we're not dealing with the brilliant Jackson outnumbered six to one at this point. He's got a massive advantage in manpower uh, and he's on home soil, so to speak. So um, listen, I'm not trying to downplay J Jackson as a general. Jackson was a great general, uh, a very solid tactician. Uh, he knew what he was doing, but this idea that he just pulled these miracles out of his hat is not exactly what was happening here. Jackson sends a strong feint to Harpers Ferry to create the impression that an invasion of the North is in the making. This was chaos. For a moment, the valley laid wide open. Although Washington was in no real threat, the damage had been done. Lincoln ordered to have Jackson's unknowing small army to be destroyed for good. Fremont, with 15,000 men, was ordered to advance to Harrisonburg. John C. Fremont was the 1856 Republican nominee for president, their very first Republican nominee in, in their history uh, as a party. And McDowell's Corps was ordered west. This occurred just as McDowell was heading south to attack the Confederate capital from the north. Lincoln's plan was to trap Stonewall in a Hammer and Annabelle movement. Even Banks' shattered command was ordered to regroup and assist. Unfortunately, the roads in the Allegheny Mountains were so wretched and terrible, Fremont had to go all the way north through Romney. Therefore, Lincoln's elaborate trap doesn't formulate as planned. Instead, it's a pincer movement with slow-moving Union armies. It is at this moment that one can clearly see Jackson's importance. Over 50,000 men were on a wild goose chase for a small army of 17,000. Right. So this is the real brilliance of the Valley Campaign. It's not that Jackson won battles against huge numbers and long odds. It's that he consumed so much Union attention and manpower in pursuing him. McDowell's Corps would not be able to assist McClellan in taking Richmond. In the end, only 10,000 men of the original 40,000 from McDowell's Corps would eventually go on to support McClellan's Peninsula Campaign. 
the loss of McDowell's command demoralized McClellan and made him even more overly cautious. Well done, Jackson. Well done. For this achievement, there is no higher accolade. And not surprisingly, Jackson's fast army was able to escape Lincoln's trap and was chased up the valley by Fremont and McDowell's lead division under Brigadier General Shields. They chased Jackson, but rather than combining and concentrating their forces, they pursued Jackson on opposite sides of the Massanutan Mountains. By dividing their forces, Fremont and McDowell have put themselves in a position to be defeated in detail. And defeat in detail means you hit one unit and you destroy them and then you have time to come back and hit the other one and do the same. Uh, and that's what you have to do when you have a smaller, more mobile force. You have to take advantage of that and Jackson did that. So again, not downplaying Jackson's, he, he did his job with what he had. He made the most of it and that should be credited to him. And Jackson saw it. Jackson made his stand at a river crossing. Fremont struck first. On June 8, he encountered Ewell's division. The battle across Keys was a Confederate victory. Jackson left a rear guard to watch over Fremont and concentrates the rest of his army to attack Shields' division. Only two brigades were in front of Port Republic. Shields and his other two brigades were 15 miles north trying to catch up. Jackson launched an attack on this smaller force of 3,500 men. And again, that's the smart call there, right? First of all, you win a victory against almost two to one odds at Cross Keys, which is great. Uh, and then with with the advantage now, now you see an opportunity. There's a big force coming my way, but only part of it's here. We're going to hit them and destroy them in detail before the rest can get there. And on June 9th, the Battle of Port Republic was fought and it was another victory for Jackson. This victory marks the end for Jackson's 1862 Valley Campaign. And soon after, the legend of the Great Stonewall Jackson was established. Looking at this list, you can see that Jackson outnumbered his enemy at every battle except Kernstown and Cross Keys. Yep. He achieved this through speed and maneuverability and by always, always concentrating all the forces he had at hand. Move quick, have your enemy, your larger enemy spread out and then concentrate your force before he can concentrate his. It's, it's brilliant strategy um, and it works out. But right after this, and it's important to give the whole picture here. Right after this, Jackson joins uh, the Confederate Army outside of Richmond and performs terribly. Um, gets lost a couple of times. Um, so he did well when independent and when he knew the territory. Because remember, Jackson's from what is now West Virginia. So this is kind of more his home territory, this area. Um, but... Uh, now, it does not do particularly well uh, at the, the battles outside of Richmond after this. He never allowed the Union armies to combine their forces. Instead, he looked for opportunities to defeat each command separately. This way, at the point of contact with the enemy, it was the Confederates who usually outnumbered the Union forces. Strategically, the 1862 Valley Campaign ranks as one of the greatest masterpieces in military history. It ended up being a grand diversion. He tied up elements of three separate armies totaling more than 52,000 men that would otherwise have been used against Richmond. It is probably certain that the Confederate capital would have fallen if it wasn't for Jackson's Shenandoah Valley campaign. That's, that's a fair statement to make. Of course, it underestimates McClellan's ability to bungle that. McClellan should have taken Richmond anyway. He had the numbers on his own to take Richmond. Uh, if pretty much any other general had been in command, if you would have had Hooker in command, if you would have had Kearney in command, if you had a Grant, if you'd had Meade in command uh, at, at this point, probably if you'd had Burnside in command, you probably take Richmond. I, McClellan might have been the one and only guy who couldn't, maybe Halleck would be the other one, who couldn't have taken Richmond in that scenario. So um, it, it's fair to say... It could have had a different outcome, but then again, who knows with McClellan. He later would dread of the valley and help General Lee, who was now in command at Richmond, to defeat McClellan in the Seven Days Battles. Yeah, and at this point, McClellan's numbers are not there, but he had a huge advantage before Ewell and Jackson uh, come to join what is now Lee's army. Uh, it will become the Army of Northern Virginia. Okay, so that was cool. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll put a link in the description so you can see the original video if you'd like. Throw up some other videos of some of my Civil War content if you want to check that out as well. Let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.